welcome. It's a radioactive banana YouTube channel. Come on in. Sit down. Grab a beverage. Enjoy yourself. I have all kinds of things to go over today. Um, I'm going to continue talking about The Last Circle and Sherry Seymour and uh, The Promise Software and Danny Casolero and Wackenhut and the Super Bowl. And why is this all important? It's important because it seems that there is a link with an old company called Wackenhut who then became G4S and there are accusations that they do the trafficking under DynCorp. So, um, or as their own, you know, company. So today I wanted to go over Sherry Seymour's information a little more. And um, one of the things I have here is a picture of off of uh, Highway 8 off Yuma, Arizona. And uh, coming off Highway 8, <laughs> you pass uh, the Indio, uh, this Indio exit, and it's 111. And it just makes me think of George Webb and the Pakistani ISI and how 111 is associated with them. And we'll go into detail uh, later on about Indio and the Cabazon Indian tribe who are all tied up with this G4S Wackenhut group. Well, it was Wackenhut then, wasn't G4S. So let's find out uh, today from Sherry Seymour. We're gonna listen a little bit to this um, interview with Radio Free Kansas, I believe this was in 2010. And so um, I want to first start with this, and then I ha I'm gonna read some documents that are gonna go over Whack and Hut and who they are uh, from different sources. And I'll attach those links, so if you, uh, you know, don't want to listen to me read, then just go to those documents and read, and then um, pick up later in the episode when you see the uh, maps come up, uh, or pictures come up. And I talk about, uh, then I'll start talking about the Cabazon Indians. So everybody likes to learn a different way. If you want to just pull these documents up, read them in their entirety, and then come back and listen to the end. Um, whatever way you like to learn. Uh, because this is a big subject. It's really important that we understand who the traffickers are, what they're doing, uh, because we have to shut them down. So remember here at Radioactive Banana, we're not... Republicans or Democrats, we're looking at subjects. And so this subject is, you know, this Promise Software, Whack and Hut, Danny Casolero's death, and how it all ties into trafficking and this Indian tribe. <laughs> There's a lot of information to cover today, so let's go ahead and start off, first of all, with just a little bit of information from Sherry Seymour in this interview. So it was... It really is a murder, but at that time, the, the mysterious death of another investigative journalist who didn't commit suicide, although that's what everyone said, Dan, a guy named Danny Casolaro. Could you tell us about him? That's sure. That's involved in it, too. Yeah. Um, my book is a chronology, actually, of yeah. an investigation, and as you said, that spanned off and on for about 18 years. But it's also an anatomy of Danny Casolaro's investigation. And um, I followed Danny's trail, interviewed most of his major sources, and I wanted to walk in his shoes and experience what he experienced so I could understand what he learned that caused his death. Danny was a Washington, D.C. journalist and a computer trade writer who began an investigation in the summer of 1990 into the theft of a revolutionary new software program that was actually the forerunner of artificial intelligence. It was called Promise or Prosecutor's Management Information System. And it was contracted by the U.S. Department of Justice to upgrade the DOJ's outdated case management system. And the developer of Promise, uh, the Promise software, was Bill Hamilton. He was the owner of Inslaw Company. And he was awarded a $10 million contract to install the program in 22 of the largest U.S. attorney's offices. And if that was successful, this was a pilot program, then they would install Promise in the remaining 74 federal prosecutor's offices around the country. But in March 1991, 
a computer scientist in California, provided an affidavit to Hamilton's lawyer, and it was Elliot Richardson. He was the former attorney general, um, and stating that promise had been modified and a backdoor or a Trojan horse had been installed in the software, and it was sold to foreign governments such as Israel, Canada, and other countries. And the purpose of the modification was allegedly so the U.S. government could secretly monitor the intelligence operations in those countries. And Castellaro jumped on this story, and he worked closely with Bill Hamilton uh, to locate and identify the persons that were responsible for modifying the software and selling it worldwide. But Castellaro learned more than he bargained for. The software investigation led him into what I call a labyrinth, comprised of international spies, drug traffickers, money launderers, unsolved murders, dating as far back as 1981. And he called this the octopus because its tentacles reached into every facet of criminal enterprise, including the mafia and the Kali drug cartel. Um, in August 1991, Castellaro filled his briefcase with documents, and he headed out to Martinsburg, Virginia, uh, to bring back the head of the octopus, quote-unquote. This was what he told his closest friends, who said that he was ecstatic about something he had recently uncovered, but he didn't say what it was. Uh-huh. And he never returned. So instead, on August 10th, 1991, his body was found in a blood-filled bathtub in room 517 of the Sheraton Hotel in Martinsburg, West Virginia. His wrists were slashed deeply 10 or 12 times, No papers were found in his hotel room or in his car. Uh, His housekeeper, Olga, had said that he had filled his briefcase with documents and took them with him when he left home. Yet um, the hotel room was clean and his body was embalmed before relatives were notified, and all his documents and his briefcase were never recovered. So there we're learning a little bit about this promise software and about how Danny Casolaro um, was connected with Bill Hamilton to begin to research, you know, what was going on with this Promise software. Uh, So let's look at this article here. Um, It's by Minute. And we're going to read, I'm going to (laughs) read a little bit for you. (laughs) And so we can learn more about this uh, Promise software. For more than a year, Danny Casolaro had been sorting through a web of intrigue. The SNL debacle, BCCI, that's a bank that went down. Iran Contra, the Contra connected Wackenhut Corporation, the Wackenhut connected Inslaw case, and the Inslaw connected October Surprise. Inslaw, Institute for Law and Social Research, was a nonprofit business created in 1974 by William Anthony Hamilton, a former analyst with the NSA and a one-time contract employee of the CIA. Inslaw developed for the United States Department of Justice a highly efficient people tracking software program known as PROMISE, or Prosecutors Management Information System, the ultimate surveillance tool, a program that could track the movements of literally untold numbers of people in any part of the world. In 1991, Michael Riconciuto, project manager for Wackenhut, testified in court that multiple versions of the Promise software were provided to him by the U.S. Department of Justice throughout 1981 to 1983. Riconciuto testified that he was contracted to modify the Promise software with advanced eavesdropping capabilities so the CIA and NSA could spy on foreign governments. Reconciuto testified the Promise software was sold to Canada and renamed the Lean software and sold to the Australian government. By including a back door, the program would allow U.S. intelligence agencies to hack into those computers wherever Promise was installed. Modifications on the software were carried out by the Wackenhub Corporation of Coral Gables, Florida. The files of Michael Riconciuto were first classified in 1982 by President Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr. and were then mysteriously reclassified in 2003 by President George W. Bush. Okay, so you have the software that an ex-CIA NSA NSA guy makes for the DOJ. They end up stealing it. (laughs) 
<laughs> having Michael Riconciuto put a back door in it, sell it to foreign countries so that you can then spy on what these foreign countries are doing. But then they also had sold it uh, to the Mossad, who then put another back door in it to follow what <laughs> the U.S. government was doing. That's in another um, uh, piece of uh, article that I have found. But, um, you know, I first found The Last Circle when Veterans Today was talking about it on a radio show. And this is the document that uh, I initially read. This one through pages one through 15 and out here on uh, Biblioteca, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so um, this is so terrific. This is kind of written like um, a legal document, and there's all these short, um, you know, paragraphs. But each one is just so incredibly packed with information, and she names the people, and she names the places, and she names the date. And that's why this book is critical, because Sherry Seymour doesn't give innuendos of who was participating in this. This book is significant because she names who all the people are. Okay, so let's read a little bit more about, you know, um, how she got the documents. Um, and this is chapter three. So I'm going to read a little bit more about this. And we're going to start here with Gunderson. And if you'll remember, um, I showed a picture of Ted Gunderson and Chip Tatum in the last video I did. So this is Ted Gunderson, and he connected with Sherry Seymour and ended up giving her documents. So let's start here. Gunderson listened carefully, occasionally interrupting to ask questions, then motioned us to follow him to the backyard. Then we stood in a circle in the middle of his yard while he surveyed the area. Satisfied that he was not being watched, he agreed to come to Mariposa with media and perform a citizen's arrest on the corrupt officials. He pulled a frazzled piece of paper from his pocket and gave me a list of telephone numbers to write down. There were numbers to telephone booths at various locations in the vicinity of his home. Each booth had been coded one, two, three, four, or five. He instructed that the next time I called him, he would give me the code number of the booth and a time to call. I would then call him at the designated booth. Eight hours later, I handed him a copy of my first book as a courtesy, then left Manhattan Beach loaded with newspaper clippings and documents, mostly relating to Casolero's investigation of the octopus. One packet was titled, The Wonderful Weapons of Wackenhut. Others related to the Inslaw Affair Iran-Contra, and various savings and loan scandals. In the van, reviewing the documents, I wondered what relationship they had to Mariposa County and why I had been giving, given the packet. The documents were far-ranging, beyond anything I had heretofore imagined, but within days of my visit to Gunderson, I would be introduced to the octopus. The following morning at 7.30 a.m., I received a collect call from a man who identified himself as Michael Riconciuto. Riconciuto, calling from the Pierce County Jail in Tacoma, Washington, said he had been informed by Gunderson that I was investigating a corruption, drug ring in Mariposa County. For 45 minutes, Riconciuto related the names of those in charge of methamphetamine operations in Mariposa, Madeira, and Fresno counties. A ton of methamphetamine had been seized in the area of my investigations, according to Riconciuto. Richard Nosey was a high-level cooker, and Jim De Silva, Ben Calcutt, and others were medium-level distributors or lieutenants. Calca was currently serving time in uh, Pleasanton Prison, for 900 pounds of methamphetamine had been seized under his control. Who's behind this ring, I asked. Riconciuto paused for a moment, then took a deep breath. It's the company. Now we know from Chip Tatum from the last video, the company is the CIA. <laughs> okay. So he says, it's the company. Arms get shipped to the Contras, the Afghanistan rebels, the Mujahideen, the Middle East, you know, to fight the Soviet influence. But the Contras and the Mujahideen don't have money to pay for arms, so they pay with drugs, cocaine, or heroin. 
The company handles the drug end of it in the U.S. What's the company? What's the company, I asked. <laughs> Rick and Shido interrupted. Wait a minute. It's a long story. You have to start at the beginning. Concerned that Rick and Shido might have to hang up, I hurried put and pushed for answers. Arms for drugs? Do you have proof? Oh, yeah. It's a self-supporting system. They don't have to go through Congress. Michael, I pressed, who ships the arms? Riconchuto quieted for a moment, gathering his thoughts. Let's start with Wackenhut. I didn't play ball with Wackenhut, so they poisoned the well for me. I'm in jail because I worked for Wackenhut. The government has put together a simple drug case against me, as if that's what I'm about, just a druggie. Tell me about Wackenhut. It's a security corporation headquartered in Coral Gables, Florida. Wackenhut provides security for the Nevada nuclear test site, the Alaskan pipeline, Lawrence Livermore Labs, you know, all the high security government facilities in the U.S. They have about 50,000 armed security guards that work for minimum wage or slightly above. On the other hand, on the Wackenhut Board of Directors, they have all the former heads of every government agency there there ever was under Ronald Reagan and George Bush, FBI, CIA, NSA, Secret Service, etc. So this is on the board of Wackenhut. You know, they've got retired Admiral Stansfield Turner, a former CIA director, Clarence Kelly, former FBI director, you have Frank Carlucci, so he names all these people, right? I interrupted him wanting to know where he fit into the picture. Well, I served as director of research for the Wackenhut facility at the Cabazon Indian Reservation in Indio, California. In 1983-84, I modified the Promise computer software to be used in law enforcement and intelligence agencies around the world. A man named Earl Bryan was spearheading a plan for worldwide use of the software, but essentially the modified software was being pirated from the owners, Bill and Nancy Hamilton. I asked, so how did that cause your arrest? Michael was articulate, but his story was becoming complicated. He continued, I signed an affidavit for the Hamiltons, stating that I had been responsible for the modification. The House Judiciary Committee on Inslaw was investigating the theft of the software, and I was afraid I would be implicated since I had performed the modification. Nine days later, in an attempt to discredit my testimony, I was arrested for allegedly operating a drug lab. I didn't want to push Reconciuto on the subject of the drug lab at that point, but voiced my foremost concern. Will the House Judiciary Committee be bringing you in to testify? Eventually, yes. All right, this is the end of part one of Treason, Wackenhut, G4S, CIA, and Cabazon Indians manufacture weapons and chemical weapons. Arms trafficking. Join me for part two. It only gets better. This is Radioactive Banana, signing out.